So here I want to discuss antigen and antibody interaction. So keep in mind that antibodies are made by B cells and antibodies target antigens. Now before I start talking about exactly what an antigen is, I want to first go through an overview of our B cells and what we've discussed already. So for with respect to B cells, B cells are part of the acquired immune response, which means they have to learn. They are very specific. They make antibodies. And a few facts about them, it, they are about the size of a red blood cell. And it makes sense because they need to travel through the blood as well. And um, they also are going to have the ability to bind to antigens directly. So with respect to our B cells, which are lymphocyte, they basically have a nucleus which takes up most of their cytoplasm. So here's their nucleus. And they are going to have on their recept on their surface what is called the B cell receptor, which is BCR for B cell receptor. And their B cell receptor is going to have some sort of antigen binding site at the end in which they can bind to this red circle, for example. Once they bind to the red circle, they are going to get activated. What happens to a lymphocyte when it gets activated, it actually polarizes and the nucleus goes to one side. And basically this is going to release antibodies. Now the antibodies look like the B cell receptor. They have this nice little Y. And they're going to be specific for that red circle. Now the antibody itself, let's look at its structure. So the antibody itself is typically drawn like a Y. And at the end, of course, it has the cup or the B cell antigen binding site. It's going to have a region that contains the antigen binding site that is called the FAB, fragment for antigen binding. It's going to have a trunk which is referred to as the FC for fragment that crystallizes. In crystallizing, it's just a technique that was used in a lab to identify the different regions of this antibody. And so you have here on the fab, this is going to be where the specificity is in the antigen binding site. And again, that antigen is for this guy, this lovely red circle. And both of the arms will bind to that same red circle. And then the FC or the fragment crystallizing, this is going to be the functional site. And so what I mean by function is, if this antibody only bound to this red circle, it wouldn't do anything. That's all it's doing. So it's binding to the red circle. It's really the FC site that gives it some sort of action potential. And we'll talk about those action potentials. So if you think about an antibody, you have the, um, the antibody that's going to bind to the antigen. And then you have the FC, the functional site, and that depends on the class of the antibody. So we have different classes. We have immunoglobulin type D, so Ig is immunoglobulin. 
we have immunoglobulin type M. And so this is really delta. Oops. And M is really mu, symbol mu. We have IgG, which is really gamma. We have IgA, which is really alpha. And then we have IgE, which is epsilon. And so these different FC regions are really what give the antibody function. So an IgM will have a different function, for example, than IgA, etc. And so now that we have revisited what a B cell is, and that we've revisited what an antibody is and the different parts of an antibody, let's start talking about antigens and antibody interactions. So the first thing we have to discuss is what is an antigen? So there really are three forms of antigens as broad categories. So the first form is what we all think about, which is an immunogen. And an immunogen is, it can induce an immune response. And an example is a virus. And a virus protein. Now the second type of immunogen or antigen is a haptin. And a haptin is too small. It cannot induce an immune response. But a haptin can bind proteins. And this means it gets larger, and this equals immunogenic. And the example is penicillin. You might go to the doctors and they ask you, do you have any allergies to any medications? And it's because medications are haptids. And if they bind to a protein in your body, they can look different and, and cause an immune response. And so you get an allergic response to penicillin, for example. Another example is poison ivy. Poison ivy by itself is not immunogenic, but once your body gets exposed to it, it can bind to a protein in your body that makes it activate your immune response and you get immunogenic. The third category is a tolerogen. And a tolerogen is basically a antigen that your immune system does not respond to. So your immune sister system is tolerogenic to that antigen. And so this is what we want to happen to our self antigens. And so we have a few forms of tolerance. We have our central tolerance. And this happens when the cells are under development. And if they react to cells, they're deleted. And then there's another tolerance that's called peripheral tolerance. And this is a cell that if responds to self antigen, is silenced. And so what's really interesting is that it was thought that central tolerance was the dominant form of tolerance against antigens of yourself so you didn't develop autoimmunity. But it's actually peripheral tolerance that is the most important. If you cannot do peripheral tolerance, 
you will basically not live usually by one year of life. Central tolerance, however, you can live a normal life if you have some defect of central tolerance. So it really is peripheral tolerance that is important. Now let's just talk about an epitope. All right, so we have our antigens. We have the antigens that are the ones we want to respond to, such as our bacteria, our fungus, parasites, and viruses. But what does that really mean? And what is our immune system really seeing? So we have, for example, a triangle. Okay, and on that triangle, we could have potentially different epitopes. So on this triangle, let me do this one, you can have the epitope that is this little point. So we'll call this epitope one. And on this triangle, you can have another epitope that is sort of two points and a straight line. And this is epitope two. Now keep in mind that a B cell can see these epitopes on an antigen directly. So let's draw our B cells. So we'll have a B cell and they'll have a B cell receptor. And at the end of this B cell receptor will be the V. And this V can respond to the pointiness of this triangle. Now we'll have another B cell, and it will have another receptor on its surface, a different receptor. And this time, let's see if I can draw this. Help, I think. Let's get this triangle. Instead of binding to the point, this B cell receptor binds to the base of the triangle. And so that's a different epitope on the same antigen. So here we have the yellow epitope, and here we have this green epitope. Same antigen, different epitope. So an, epitope, an antigen can have many epitopes. Now epitopes can be linear, which mean they're continuous. So here's an example of an antibody that is binding to a linear. We'll make this one a pink. So it's continuous epitope. Or it can be discontinuous. Oops. And an example of a discontinuous would be and basically the epitope in the discontinuous, for example, might look something like this. So it's only touching at two points, and the rest of it is not. Whereas a continuous might be touching at multiple points along. So antigens and epitopes can take on many different shapes, and B cell receptors and T cell receptors have to be able to bind to all these different shapes. So what is an epitope? An epitope is the portion of antigen that induces the antibody response. It's what the actual antibody sees. All right, so antibody 101. If you haven't heard this, there is another term associated with antibodies, and it's called gamma globulin. 
So just to understand what this is actually meaning is that when antibodies were being identified, basically they are part of your serum. Now your serum is made up of a series of proteins and many of the proteins are made by your liver cells. That's why your liver is so important, so please be nice to your liver. So if you were to run protein fragments from serum on a uh, mass spec or some sort of spectrophotometry type thing, uh, you would get some peaks, so and then you get like a little bit of dribble, and then you get a huge peak. And so the fraction over here is a, is usually made up of serum albumin, and this is the most abundant protein in your blood. And then over here is called the gamma fragment. And this is where most of your antibodies are. And so that's why antibodies return the gamma globulins. So 20% of your plasma proteins, serum proteins in the blood, are antibody subtype G, which if you remember, is our gamma antibody. And so that's why it has a large fragment and that's why antibodies were thought all to fall into this gamma area. Of course, we have different antibodies. We have alphas and epsilons, but a majority of them are gammas. And so that's where they fragmented to. And so that's where they got the name gamma globulins. Okay, so let's go over antibody structure because that's important to understand. So for our antibody structure, we have two heavy chains, and we have two light chains. Now, I'm going to start to color these. Oops, I want to use this guy, sorry. So these are referred to as variable heavy, so V equals variable, variable light, variable heavy, variable light. The variable region is where antigen binds. That's why it's called the variable region. Every antibody binds a different antigen. So in this case, we'll say it binds to this pink antigen. Okay, now we have another region. Oops, I'm doing the wrong one. We have our constant light, and we have our constant heavy. So this is our constant heavy, constant, oops, constant heavy, and constant light. So remember we have a light chain, and we have the heavy chain. What this is showing is that both heavy and light chain have variable regions so that they can bind to antigen, and both heavy and light chains have constant regions so they can form the structure of the antibody. Now another thing that antibodies have is they have carbohydrates. And this is to protect them from degradation. So you have a lot of enzymes in your blood um, that can degrade proteins, and so the carbohydrates on your antibodies will help prevent that. You also have another region, and this is referred to as a hinge region. And this is for flexibility. And this is so your antibodies can twist and turn and bind to antigens, different epitopes on the same virus, different, ep this, I'm sorry, the same epitopes on different locations of the virus, same epitopes on different locations of the bacteria, so they can twist and turn. So it gives them, them some flexibility. We've already talked about the different regions and what they're called. Let me get rid of this guy. Bring him down there. And so we have this region here, which is called the fab. 
a fragment of antigen binding, and then we have this region here that's called the FC, the fragment crystallization. And so just keep in mind that within the heavy chain and light chain, you have the constant and variable regions. The FAB and the FC are different. That FAB is describing the re this section which antibody binds, and the FC is describing the section that has function. Okay, so next up I want to just talk about antibody properties. And so we basically have different antibodies. We have an IgM, we have the IgD, we have the IgG, we have IgE, and we have IgA. And so remember, this is all the FC regions, not the antigen binding regions. So let's see, we have a symbol. The IgM is our mu. The IgD is our delta, that delta, gamma, epsilon, and alpha. We have our half-life. Half-life means if you start with 20 and you have a half-life of two days, in two days, at 20 is now 10. In four days, at 10 is now five. So the half-life of your antibodies in the blood, in your serum, which is the protein fragment of blood, IgM is about seven days. IgD is about two to three days. Gamma is 21 days. Epsilon, very short, two days. And IgA, about seven days. Now we're talking now about function. So let me draw a line here. Oops. Okay, here's our line, and now we're discussing function. And we have activate complement. That is the main function of our IgM. Our IgD, I'm not even going to put it there, IgD does nothing. IgG can activate complement, and then we have placental transfer. protects the fetus from infections, only IgG. And then you have FC receptors. Now remember, we're talking about FC regions. So our FC regions combine to FC receptors. So FC receptors will be available for our IgG, IgE, and IgA. And FC receptor basically means that FC region can bind to something on the surface of another cell and have some other function. And so that's basically what those three can do, G, E, and A. They can interact with other cells. So we're going to go a little bit over antibody functions. So we have IgM. IgM is always the first antibody made. doesn't matter what pathogen it is. It can activate complement. It's no memory. And it's good for extracellular pathogens. And it's because of complement. Complement is in our extracellular spaces. Those zymogens, those proteins, and your antibody IgM is a good activator of them. We have our IgD, which is only on naive, never seen antigen, B cells. No other function. And it gets lost. We have IgG. IgG is going to be able to cross the placenta activate complement it has the ability to be a neutralizer 
has an opsonin. Opsonin means you can make your phagocytic cells better at eating pathogens, and it has memory. And your IgG is going to be important for intracellular as well as extracellular pathogens. We have our IgE, which is for the allergic response. but it's also for parasites. And it's going to bind its FC epsilon receptor to high affinity on mast cells. And this is what causes those allergic responses. And we have IgA. IgA is the most abundant in secretions in your gut in your lungs, outside of your body. And it's going to be important for what we refer to as mucosal immunity. Your mucosal immune response is your lungs, your gut, those type of responses. And it's going to be important for viruses and your bacteria. And it has memory. And your IgE also has memory. It remembers your allergies, unfortunately. So in conclusion, with respect to your antibodies, uh, antibody antigen interactions, keep in mind your antibody is made by B cells. Your, your antibodies are specific for the same antigen that your B cells are specific for. You can also have passive immunity with antibodies. So you can transfer antibodies from mother to child to, to fetus, for example. And basically the order is you have your naive B cell, and it has IgD, IgM, and then you get activated, and you have B cell, is IgM, and then you get differentiation, what we also refer to as switching, and then you get IgG or IgA or IgE. And this switching is dependent on your CD4 T cell. So your CD4 T cell, the orchestrator of your immune response, is going to say, we have an intracellular virus. I need you, B cell, to make an IgG. Or we have an extracellular worm, so I need you, B cell, to make an IgE in order to respond to that threat. And so that's where the T cells are going to come into the story.